After my video breakdown of We Don't Talk About Bruno, it became apparent that a lot of you were excited by the overlapping melody technique that I talked about in that song. A lot of you noticed that Lin-Manuel Miranda also used overlapping melodies in Hamilton and in the Heights. But how do these overlapping melodies work? Here are the six levels of overlapping melodies in musical theater. And oh yeah, We Don't Talk About Bruno is only at level three. Or is it? But first, I want to tell you about this video's sponsor, Honey. It's this amazing online shopping tool which scours the internet for promo codes so you don't have to. And you know that when Honey finds a coupon, it saves 18% on average? Maybe that's why with over 100,000 reviews, Honey has a five-star rating from the Chrome Web Store. And it's super easy to set up. Just go to joinhoney.com slash Howard Ho and click on Add to Chrome or Safari or Firefox. The website will actually auto-detect which browser you're using. And once you do that, you can start saving right away. Because anytime you visit an eligible store, Honey will prompt you that a code is available and it will ask if you want to apply that code and that's it. Honey works on a ton of your favorite websites and best of all, it's free. That's right, just head over to joinhoney.com slash Howard Ho and you'll be helping me out too if you do that. Help me! Now in the beginning, there was only melody. Literally, level one is just a single melody that is sung against that exact same melody, which is known as a canon or a round. You know it as row, row, row your boat. But it's not just nursery rhymes. Classical composers have used it as well, such as Pachelbel's famous canon in D, Bach in countless canons, including the ones in the Goldberg variations and his famous crab canon, and Mozart in, I swear I'm not making this up, a canon called Lick My Ass. Yeah, the guy kind of had a dirty mind. Anyway, typically the canon or round doesn't need accompaniment as the melody becomes its own accompaniment. Okay, in Pachelbel's canon, you do have this famous bass line that became the foundation for all of pop music, but putting that aside, the basic technique of the canon is that it's a melody that is harmonizing with multiple versions of itself that have staggered entrances, meaning that each instance of the melody begins slightly after the one before it. You may remember that I talked about canons in my video on the Ten Dual Commandments from Hamilton. I mentioned canons because of the way the counting theme in the Ten Dual Commandments is transformed into this through a process that involves a delay which is sort of which like sort of like a staggered and staggered and in a canon in a canon perhaps my favorite example of a canon in musical theater is the song will i from rent which has four instances of this melody playing against itself at the same time and the entrances are staggered by one bar giving us this will i lose my dignity The next level is a fugue. Now, what is a fugue? Well, imagine if you had a canon, but instead of each instance of the melody being an exact copy of the original, now each instance of the melody branches off to have its own separate trajectory and adventures. Basically, it's a melody as if it's being filtered through a multiverse, where each melody is the same but branches off slightly differently and then is forced to be together in the same musical space. You're, You're like me. And while the topic of fugues is super fascinating and interesting, in the interest of time, I'm just going to boil it down to saying that the absolute champ of fugal writing is Bach, who not only wrote fugues throughout his entire life, but also died while working on his monumental definitive piece, The Art of Fugue. It's a technique that a lot of music students, including myself, learned in music school. For example, here's a fugue I wrote based on the guitar riff from Radiohead's My Iron Lung. First you have the Radiohead riff by itself. 
and then while that first one continues on on an adventure, a second version of the melody shows up in the bass. But then the bass goes off on its own adventure while the melody shows up in the first voice, and the melody just keeps getting traded around. Or to use an analogy, Let's say that a speech is kind of like a melody in that a speech is made up of a bunch of words and a melody is made up of a bunch of notes. Well, you kind of get a spoken word fugue in Hamilton. You know how Alexander Hamilton is debating Samuel Seabury in Farmer Refuted? Heed not the rabble who scream revolution. They have not your interest at heart. Well, Hamilton doesn't just refute Seabury's ideas, but he also mimics the sound of Seabury's words against him. Have you all unravel at the sound of screams, but the revolution is coming. The have nots are gonna win this. That's all to listen to you with the Straight face. Those shared syllables are kind of like Hamilton restating Seabury's melody, while also going on a few verbal escapades of his own. Kind of like what a fugue does, but with words instead of music. In fact, fugues do tend to sound like musical debates. Perhaps the most famous fugue in musical theater is the fugue for three tin horns at the beginning of Guys and Dolls, which is three people arguing about what horse is going to win a race. But it's actually not quite a fugue. Since everyone is singing the melody verbatim, it's more like a canon, but it still does manage to capture the overlapping argumentative nature of a fugue. An actual musical theater fugue would be the cool fugue from West Side Story with music by Leonard Bernstein. And here Bernstein shows off not only by having a fugue, but having it based on three different melodies that are weaving in and out of each other. Add them all together and you get this. George Gershwin composed the Catfish Row Fugue to underscore a tense fight scene in his opera Porgy and Bess. And if you're wondering why these are instrumental fugues and not sung, well, performing fugues is pretty demanding and thus a sung fugue in a musical is actually pretty rare. In fact, the only one I could find was from Stephen Schwartz's The Magic Show in a song called The Goldfarb Variations. Oh my god, it's... All right, we're finally adding another element to our overlapping melodies, the accompaniment. And what adding an accompaniment means is that we don't necessarily need crazy fugal counterpoint anymore because the accompaniment can now be the glue that keeps everything from devolving into chaos and cacophony. And by adding more and more melodies on top of that first one, you can create amazing storytelling complexities. The most recent examples of overlapping melodies that grow out of a single accompaniment are the TikTok musicals initiated by composer Daniel Mertzloff, where he begins with a melody and an accompaniment and we're fighting in a grocery store and slowly layer by layer other people add on to this until you have a complete musical scene in a supermarket and we're fighting in a grocery store or a thanksgiving dinner another example of this is confrontation from les mis which is basically a reprise of part of the work song, but this time with another melody added onto it, creating this, well, confrontation. And yes, this is where I would put We Don't Talk About Bruno. In my video about that song, I talked about how the song mostly tethers its melody to this Montuno rhythm and bass line. But, but there's more to it than just that, which I will come back to. Now we're ready to add genres into the mix, and this is where the real magic of overlapping melodies occurs. Because we're hearing two melodies together that you never expected to hear together. Because they come from different genres, and that's why it's a surprise that these melodies work well together. This is often why mashups are so much fun, because you can collide a recent Disney melody with a classic hip hop accompaniment, for example, and it's exhilarating. Or combining a Cantonese chant with a 2000s boy band in Turning Red. I'm not so, so. I never met nobody. Not so, so. Like you. 
but many composers from the past have done this as well, including songwriters who wrote for the pop music precursor, vaudeville. There's a classic vaudeville trick where you have a slow kind of soft shoe melody, right? Dun, 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 dun. That's UCLA musicology professor Robert Fink, and he's talking about a melody kind of like this. And then somebody else is going da da dun da da dun dee da 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 dun And then they come together. That was Irving Berlin's song Play a Simple Melody from all the way back in 1914. More recently, musicals like Spring Awakening have used this technique. There, the composer Duncan Sheik combined the rhythmic, angsty song Don't Do Sadness, I don't do sadness not even a little bit. with the slow, flowing song Blue Wind. Spring and summer, every other day. Add them together and you get... And that combination is the satisfying cherry on top because those songs were already so good as separate songs. This level is basically the previous level, but with three or more genres represented, and so in essence, it's level four, but hyper. Kind of like if you mashed up 75 different pop songs together into a Broadway show like Moulin Rouge did. Or if you mashed up 27 musicals from 2010's Broadway like I did. But in terms of original music, Sondheim was known for using this to further his story and express his characters. In A Little Night Music, he wrote three songs titled Now, Now, as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap, Later, Later, What is late, and Soon. Soon, I promise. Each one of these songs focuses on a different character contemplating a unique situation with a different song in a different style until they all come together in that final song. Sondheim would later outdo himself in the song Please Hello from Pacific Overtures. As Sondheim explains in his book Finishing the Hat, the music of Please Hello is a series of pastiches, Sousa March. Last time we come, come with warships, now with more ships, say hello! Gilbert and Sullivan patter. Hello, I come with letters from Her Majesty Victoria, who learning how you're treating us like hallelujah, Gloria, and sent me to contain to you her positive euphoria, as well as it'll get some Britain's various emporia. Dutch clog dance. Don't forget the Dutch, like to keep in touch, thank you very much. Russian dirge. Oh, he's bringing Kazar's request. And French can can. <laughs> That's five different songs for five different characters in five distinct genres from five different countries, which is impressive enough, but then he made it so that they could all, along with a sixth character who represents the Japanese, sing simultaneously on top of each other. And Lin-Manuel Miranda brought this technique into the present day with his first musical, In the Heights, with the song 96,000. 96, and in that song, you have hip-hop representing the crew of Benny, Usnavi, Sonny, and Graffiti Pete. 96,000. Dollars, holla! 96,000. That's a lot of spray cans. 96,000. Yo. R&B for Benny. For real though. <laughs> Dance hall reggae for Daniela and Carla. And a ballad for Vanessa. All 
all of which are great on their own as songs, but then come together in this absolute showstopper. Remember when I said I would come back to We Don't Talk About Bruno? Well, that's because some of the characters in that song do appear to make subtle changes to the genre of the music when they come in. For example, the music is mostly this acoustic sounding arrangement until Dolores' first entrance, which brings in a more 808 sounding hip hop beat. And then when Camilo enters, he brings in some hi-hat triplets reminiscent of a trap beat. Then of course, when Isabella and Dolores come in later, they are welcomed with a new chord progression and a new genre, which I will call an up-tempo ballad. So in a way, We Don't Talk About Bruno does share some elements with Level 5 as well. But I think We Don't Talk About Bruno tips its hat at genre, but doesn't give us fully-fledged song-within-a-song differentiated genres that we'd expect from Level 5. So to me, it's a Level 3 with Level 5 characteristics. So after our multiple melodies and accompaniments and genres, what could possibly be the next level? Well, of course, the next level would be if the songs being overlapped came not just from one part of the show, but were reprises from songs that have been spread throughout an entire act of a show culminating in an epic musical sing-off. Usually composers want to reserve this type of epicness for the place where it would structurally be the most beneficial, the Act 1 Closer. After all, people are about to head off into intermission, so you kind of need to remind them of who is who and why things are happening and raise everyone's anticipation so they come back for Act 2. The technique of ending Act 1 with overlapping melodies is an efficient way of doing that. In fact, some people have speculated that if we see Encanto make it to Broadway, We Don't Talk About Bruno would end up being the Act 1 closer. This technique of big act closing overlapping melody songs goes back to opera, where it was called a finaletto. They're usually dramatic moments which are common in Italian opera. Everybody stops and they all give their perspective on what's happening at that moment. And oftentimes they, they each do it individually and then it all comes together. Those are famous moments because they are supposedly the example of why opera is the unique art and that you can have three, four, or even six people at the same time expressing totally different emotions simultaneously, and it's not just gibberish. The classically minded Leonard Bernstein famously brought the finaletto into West Side Story with his Tonight Quintet, even though it technically doesn't end Act 1 but comes right before the rumble, which then ends Act 1. However, it builds a lot of anticipation by juxtaposing an aggressive melody with a reprise of the romantic duet Tonight. tonight, tonight it all and together, they sound like this. And it's called a quintet because it ends with five different melodic lines overlapping from the Jets, the Sharks, Tony, Maria, and Anita. Perhaps one of the most epic versions of this finaletto has to be One Day More from Les Miserables, which culminates in all of our main characters, Eponine. Marius and Cosette in a duet. Tomorrow you'll be worlds away. Jean Valjean. One day more. Javert. One day more to revolution. We will nip it in the butt. And even the Tenadiers. But you run a hack. Catch him as that bow. Never know your luck when there's a free bow bow. All the reprises from the show overlapping on top of each other. which undoubtedly made a big impression on the young Lin-Manuel Miranda. I think Les Mis was the first musical I ever saw, and I was seven years old. And so, of course, Lin had to end Act 1 of his epic musical Hamilton with a similarly epic overlapping melody finaletto. So we get Burr singing. Why do you assume you're the smartest in the room? Assume that attitude may be your joke. And Eliza singing. Isn't this enough? And Angelica singing. And George Washington singing History of All at the same time while the ensemble is singing Put it all together and you get this And those are the six levels of overlapping melodies in musical theater 
What are your favorite examples of overlapping melodies in musicals? Let me know in the comments. I'd like to thank Professor Robert Fink of UCLA and all my patrons on Patreon, including my newest patrons, Mikakov, Sherry Hofferth, Karen Osterman, Jane, Nancy Collins, Ben Hu, Sharon Salzberg, Jessica Xu, Catherine Howell, Rachel Skiles, Debbie Smetherham, Dominique Freitas, David Linton, Carol Cullen Smith, Roberta Piazza Gordon, Benedict Rattray, Cody Westerland, Darker Wing, Scott St. Jean, Amit Slonim, Amy Tegan Schubert, David Clay, Antoinette Carroll, and Carol DeGeer. Subscribe for more musical breakdowns, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.